One of the things that we've been learning is that we need divine power if we're going to deal with strongholds, if we're going to break spiritual forces. And um, I understand that there are some of you who are just afraid of talking about spiritual things, spiritual forces specifically. I understand that some of you don't like the idea of the possibility of there being demons around and them actually having an influence on our lives. And, and, and I understand that some of you would say, uh, that, oh, those are, there's no such thing. Uh, that's just uh, something that happens in, you know, these, these really um, uh, underprivileged, backward cultures who just don't know. And so they credit everything to some kind of a god or some kind of um, supernatural power, and therefore they use it as a word na the word name demons. But, but we don't have to deal with that in America because we are much smarter. I'm not sure the denial of truth is very smart. But I understand that somebody say, you know, oh man, I, I just the idea of demons, uh, you know, gives me willies. No, I'm a willy, and so it gives me gi gives me this, you know, chill down my back. It makes me uncomfortable, makes me nervous. I understand that, but here's the fact: God is real. Do you believe that? Yes. Jesus is the Son of God. Divine power came in the human form came in the flesh, died and rose from the dead. Do you believe that? He also said he was going to send his Holy Spirit, the comforter, the courager, the one who's going to come alongside. In fact, it's when we say yes to Jesus come in, into our life, when we say yes to his forgiveness, who actually comes and dwells within us? The Holy Spirit. Okay, I think, isn't God supernatural? Right? Spirit, right? not human. Isn't that what demons are too? Supernatural, not human. If we deny the existence and the reality of Satan and the demons, don't we also have to deny the existence of a supernatural God? If we're so intelligent that we don't need anything beyond this world and there is nothing beyond this world, aren't we denying it all? not just the powers of darkness? Or if we say, no, these things all ended, like last week we talked about cessationist theology. If we say, we simply have come to a time when those things that were supernatural, they no longer exist because God took care of all the demons, Jesus got rid of them all, and we don't have to deal with them ever again. Well, that's not true, is it? In fact, the, the, the word tells us that Jesus didn't take care of every need. He didn't cast out every demon. He didn't heal every sick person. But the Holy Spirit comes and anoints and empowers his people to do his work. Ephesians 6 is our, our root passage for what we've been doing in this series. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, but they have power to break down strongholds. Finally, brothers, be strong in the Lord. Put on the full armor of God that you can stand and keep on standing against the powers of darkness. When did Paul write that? He wrote that somewhere around 60, 70 AD. Okay? The temple is about to be destroyed. Persecution is increasing. And Paul himself will lose his life on behalf of Christ. Did he say okay, this is just for today. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Oh, by the way, that's just for the people that are alive right now. Those of you who are going to come later, centuries down the road, you're not going to need it because all the evil is going to be taken care of. Jesus said that Satan is a liar, the father of lies, and that may be one of the worst lies. No, no. You don't have to deal with evil anymore because it's all taken care of. The fact is, evil is still present today. And you can ignore it, you can be afraid of it, or you can realize that you have the resources to stand strong against it and therefore don't need to be afraid. We need divine weapons. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. 
The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, but they have power to break down strongholds. On the contrary, they have divine power to what? Demolish strongholds. This morning we're going to be looking at Nehemiah. And we're going to look at a weapon that I've already mentioned to you today. And the, the weapon, the weapon is confession. And it's an incredibly powerful tool when we use it properly, when we make use of it. Nehemiah actually confesses the sins of the people. In fact, he even puts an I to that. I confess our sins. And he goes corporate with his, with his prayer of confessions. One of the reasons why this is such a powerful weapon is because Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. When you confess, what are you doing? Facing the truth. You're admitting the truth. You're admitting it to yourself. You're admitting it to God. And and James says, confess your faults one to another. So when you confess to somebody else, you're admitting to somebody else the the truth. And when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Nehemiah chapter 1, we're going to look at that text, and, um, and, and let's, let's read through it if you have your Bibles. <clears throat> it's before Psalms, if you're looking in your Bible, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms. So you can go to Psalms, which is in the middle of your book, and then you back up to the left, and you should be able to find Nehemiah fairly quickly, right before Job. But we're going to look at the first chapter of Nehemiah. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa. Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. Let's just pause for a moment. Um, Where is Nehemiah? He's among the exiles. He's in Babylon. He got taken there by this time, almost um, 70 years earlier, his whole family did. He was never even in Jerusalem, never lived there. So he's among the exiles that were taken there, and he grew up in Babylon. He's grown up in a form of captivity. It says, those who survived the exile are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. His brother and these other men have been to Jerusalem because they've actually been getting a lot of freedom. I mean, Nehemiah is a leader in the country and, and others. Um, Daniel, others have been significant, had significant roles already. And eventually, because God planned it, they're going to get set free. They're going to get to go back. In fact, um, they're actually going to be told, look, we're, you're supposed to go back. You're supposed to rebuild the temple. And he says, when I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, now now listen to his prayer. This is after he's already wept over Jerusalem. He's been crying about it. He's been fasting and just trying to get closer to God. And now he's from his praying, he's understood. This is what he's supposed to ask of God. O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer. Your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. Notice how um, Nehemiah begins this prayer. It's an acknowledgement of the greatness of God, how awesome God is. God's a covenant keeper. God's committed to loving us. He's not going to stop loving us. And he especially keeps that covenant to those who obey him. In other words, to those who keep the covenant with him. And Nehemiah says, look, I'm just a servant, but I know you're a God of love. I know that you answer prayer. I know that you care about us. I know that you're committed to us, God, and that's why I'm talking to you right now. Now look how he then really hits it when he hits the heart of his prayer. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. 
Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. And then we learn the secret. I was the cupbearer to the king. <laughs> Insignificant role, right? He gets the privilege of eating from the king's table. Everything the king eats, he gets to taste ahead of him. That's pretty special. How many people get to eat right next to the king? Of course, the king always watches him to see what happens. How did it taste? Tasted great. Yeah? How do you feel? Feeling sick. Good. That's why I'm not eating it. <laughs> now, it was the role of the cupbearer, right? Cupbearers were dispensable, but extremely important to the king. The king had to really trust them, had to build a relationship with them. Does the they were going to offer their life potentially for him. And, but they could trick him, right? They could cheat him. They could do something that would cause him to be killed. So they built a significant relationship with one another. And God had put Nehemiah in this incredible role where every day at every meal, he's right there next to him. Don't you love God? <laughs> and the amazing way that he works. Nehemiah says, I question them. My brother and these friends come back from Jerusalem. And I, and I question them. I, I, he examines what's going on. In fact, this is one of the things we need to be go doing if we're going to really pray for our nation and, and pray individually. We need to examine ourselves. We need to examine what's going on around us. Nehemiah does it. He says, oh, okay, so what's it like back there? Tell me about the situation. And they share with him, the walls are broken down. The gates are burned down. There's no temple. The people are discouraged and depressed. It's really bad back in Jerusalem. Then he goes into those specific kinds of details that we need to recognize if we're going to confess the sins of ourselves and our nation. You can't just get up and say, okay, God, I confess my sin. Whew, glad I didn't have to tell you what it was. And it's the specific confession that makes a difference. Again, I, I, I recommend you, you look at the 12 steps and you sp especially consider that fourth one where you take that honest inventory. And the only person you hurt when you don't take an on to this honest inventory is guess who? Yourself, because you're the one that you're lying to. No one else. You're the one that you're keeping from, from healing and new life and joy and freedom. But the same thing is true of our culture. When we try to say nothing is a sin, everything is okay, nothing matters, like our culture wants us to say, we are denying truth and people cannot be free. And so we've got to face up to and confess real specific sin. He looks, he asks questions, he examines, and he gets to know the details of Jerusalem. And what happens when he does that? He says, I sat down and wept. Have you been at that place where you saw your own nasty side? Where you, where you saw your garbage and you sat down and wept? Sometimes we say people have to hit bottom before they can go up, right? Right? And that's, kind of, that's a little bit of what, what Nehemiah has to do there. He's got to hit this place of bottom and say, Oh, Lord, and it has to hurt him. It has to grieve him. It has to touch his heart. He's broken so much over it that he weeps uncontrollably. He says, For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. It was so intense. His grief for his sin was so strong and for the sin of the nation that it it broke him. 
Now, I, earlier I said something to you. I gave you a little hint that I think is really kind of special about this word when, it, when he says, and I confessed. What does he do next? I confessed sin. And, and in his prayer, he actually says, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself, have committed. Wait a second. He never lived in Jerusalem. How did he commit those sins? He'd never been there. He'd never been a part of that. He hadn't broken all the commandments. In fact, he seems to be a man really of God in prayer, one who honors the Lord and is faithful to him and understands the covenant. He's even praying about the covenant. But he says, look, I've done it because I've been a part of this family. My heritage comes from this family. And because of that, I confess these sins and look they're even my sins he emphasizes that in case you, we want to kind of oh no he's just saying that in the figure of speech no no he's saying look i am confessing the sins my sins the sins we israelites including myself and my father's house look it's deeper than this it's not just one or two people what we've committed against you Psalm 51, David said, You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. In order to get free, don't we have to get broken? We've got to come to that place where... Oh, Lord, I have sinned against you. We, we've got to truth ourselves and truth the Lord. Second Chronicles says he removed the foreign altars and the high places, smashed the, the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. Why did I mention that verse? It shows you what it means to be broken. To be broken means you've got to smash the stuff in your life that's messing you up. It has to so bother you that you say, I'm going to get rid of it. I'm not going to hold on to some of this for later. I'm not going to continue this, you know, only change it a little bit. I'm going to actually break down. This is the problem with Israel. They kept the Asherah poles. They kept the idols. And they continued to worship them. They kept the high places. But when the king said, okay, look, Hezekiah, we're going we're to smash them down. We're going to break them apart. That's the same word as a broken and contrite heart. We need to smash the things that are inside of our hearts. Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is close to the broken hearted. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. When you've really faced it, when you've really admitted the, the garbage, the sin, the stuff in your life that's not right, when you really get honest about that, there is a part of you that gets crushed. There is a part of your heart that just breaks. And you cry out because you understand, I've sinned against you, God. I have sinned. It's been now three years or so ago when we as a church tried to look at this in a corporate way and say, what, what are our sins as a church? And we, we took a weekend to do this and several weeks to really pray about this and finally came up with a sense that God was telling us that we had four sins that had been harming us seriously. And think about these sins. I think they're fairly common when you really look at them. The first one is disobedience. And the fact is, is that one of the chief sins of God's people, forget about the world right now, okay? Let's just look at us. Those of us who maybe say we're Christians, we, our chief sin is disobedience. And guess what? One of the worst sins that we're committing is the sin of disobedience to the Great Commission and to the Great Commandments, love your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord with everything you've got in you. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all people. And we are breaking, disobeying those commands in a serious kind of way. Disobedience. The second word what we came up with was dissent. Ever, have you ever noticed that, that the people kind of complain about other people? Talk about them, criticize, get judgmental, get hostile about them. Um, in fact, what I've noticed is sometimes those of us who are carrying the most garbage might be the most critical of somebody else's garbage. I think it's because we already smell what it looks like. We, it's already familiar to us. And so, so we recognize it in somebody else. But we attack and dissent and talk about instead of 
honoring and loving and blessing. The third word is deceit. You see, that's where we go. Uh, after we started disobeying, and then we started criticizing, uh, now what do we got to do? Well, now we got to lie. We, we got to lie to ourselves. We got to lie to other people. We've got to exaggerate about somebody else's so that wrong and their behavior so that they don't see ours. We got to put a mask on and pretend I'm I'm great. I'm perfect. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> and it's all a form of deceit. And then lastly, that leads us to disunity. And that's what we saw happening in our church, in our fellowship here that we had fallen into those four serious sins, disobedience, dissent, deceit, and disunity. In discussing that, we said, we are making a conscious choice to disobey. Oh, ouch. We are making a conscious choice to disobey. We have become Un unconsciously habitual in our disobedience. We no longer see the disobedience. And this means we need to repent. This is so easy to ignore even when the opportunity is staring us in the face. Our leaders and our church had to seriously examine that. What were we going to do about our disobedience? our dissent, our deceit, and our disunity. They were fierce weapons used against this ministry for too long. They put us in a form of captivity, a place of darkness that hindered us from serving. And therefore, what do you do? When you uncover sin, what should you do with it? you got to confess it. Nehemiah chapter 1 verses 5 to 7. Nehemiah is now praying, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly toward you. Wow, how many of you like to use that word to describe yourself? I've been behaving wickedly. And you, he's saying that to God. God, we've acted wickedly towards you. But he's being honest. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. <laughs> See, confession in this case was a corporate thing that Nehemiah was doing on behalf of all the people. And as he does this, something is going to happen that's going to be wonderful. The children of Israel are going to be sent back home. They're going to be set free from bondage. They're going to be brought back from exile because God, yes, God remembered his promise to them. And they remembered, remembered that if they would repent, God would respond. A gentleman named Arnold Fr Fruchtenbaum, has a cool name, <laughs> said, every time a believer sins, he's rebelling against God and therefore is subject, is not subject to him. Every time a believer sins, he's rebelling against God and therefore is not subject to him. Therefore, he must subject himself to God and the means of doing so is by confession of sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. But here's the cool thing about this word. When I confess, I praise God. When I confess, I'm praising God. The word is yada. It's a word, the word that is used more often for praise than it is used for confession. In fact, Psalm 106 says it this way, praise the Lord, yada, Yahweh. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Yada. Now, now every time we say this, think about what if you put in the word there, confess. Confess to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. When I confess, don't I maybe experience more love than at any other time? When I simply open up and am honest with him? Psalm 7, 17. I will give yada to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing the yada of the name of the Lord most high. I will sing the praises. I'm going to go ahead and sing my confession. Wait a second. 
How often do we confess in front of one another? Now, we're supposed to praise all the time, aren't we? But, but how often do we, yada, do we confess in front of one another? Um, um, ooh, that's a little bit more risky, isn't it? By the way, we, I've got the um, microphone here. We're going to start here at the front. We're going to pass it around. Just <laughs> He's just laughing and closing his eyes. I don't, can't believe that. It's turning red, too, from the nervousness. Why don't we do that? Think, think about that. Why don't we do that? When confession and praise go hand in hand, when I'm, when I'm confessing, I'm actually praising God. How can that possibly be? Because when I'm confessing, I'm looking at only Him. I'm being so honest with Him that nothing else is going to get between us and our relationship. So when I'm confessing, I'm acknowledging God's God. Isn't that what praise should be? Shouldn't I be celebrating who he is? I mean, he does care about me. He does love me. Just as ugly and dirty and sinful as I am, but I'm being honest about it, and he says, yes, I love you. That's praise. That's adoration. Folks, that's what confession should be. And so he invites us. Confess. And, and Nehemiah says, I'm confessing. And there are several other verses, and you can do your own word study on that and see uh, all, all the different verses. But get this, psalm is full. Every time in the psalms, he, ne- he uses the word praise instead of confess. Do you remember the book that's right after psalms? The book of wisdom? Proverbs? Well, guess what word's used there. Proverbs twenty-eight thirteen: Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Now I start to understand why confession is praise. Because when I hold my sin in, I'm beating myself up, I'm harming myself, but when I confess, this is what David said, when I confessed my sin, the stuff that was messing me up, when I opened up with God, when I agreed with God about it, when I took it to Him, when I got honest about my sin, my body that had been decaying away suddenly is set free because that's when I find mercy. And when I find mercy, can I do anything but praise and celebrate and be thankful? Confession leads individuals to mercy and confession in Nehemiah's case what he wants to teach us is confession can lead a people to mercy and Israel will be set free think about it if confession is good for individual Christians then what will it do if a church confesses (laughs) if a church can just be honest about their weaknesses their shortcomings their sin their disobedience then then what will God do for a church Give it mercy. Equip it with mercy, with loving kindness, so that it can be a giver of that to others. Jesus challenged the seven churches of Asia with their sins, didn't he? He speaks to each one of them. He says, look, listen to me. If you have ears to hear, listen to me. I want to say some things to you about you. I've got these things, and frankly, I've got these things against you. And, he, and he, each time he points out, he says, I've got this, sin, this thing against you. He identifies, for example, for Ephesus. He says, you've forsaken your first love. You've forgotten what really matters. I've got it. I'm holding that against you. To, to Pergamum, he says, you're giving into false teaching and, and, and you're eating food sacrificed to idols and you're committing sexual immorality and your world's trying to say it's okay. To Thyatira, he says, you're also committing sexual immorality and, and you're studying the secret things of Satan. Whoa. And to Sardis, he says, you've fallen asleep and you haven't finished the work I've given to you. You've gotten lazy. You're simply spending your time on the bed. He says, you need to get out and do something. He says, to each one of them, to Laodicea, Laodicea, Ben, I need your help. This never came up with my message today, and it's making noise, so just shut it off or whatever you want to do. You know how an iPad, right? Good, thank you. 
because it's now ringing, telling me about the rams. And, <laughs> and I'm a Cardinals fan, so. <laughs> and they're losing too, so I really don't want to know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they have been, so <laughs> probably are again. <laughs> That's right, they're playing each other, aren't they? Well, no wonder it's the Rams and the Cardinals telling us stuff. Okay, let's check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk about USC. Still grieving. That's a word for later in the message. <laughs> Laodicea has become lukewarm. They're not hot or cold. They're just blah. They're yucky. They're gross. They taste terrible. You, you want to spit blah out of your mouth. Even Philadelphia and Smyrna have needed to hold firm and seek the Lord in the midst of their persecution. And to each one of them, he says, what? Repent. Repent. You've got to be broken in your heart. You've got to turn from what you're doing. Repent. And I will come. I will bless. Daniel does the same thing. Daniel confesses the sin of the people for his nation as well. Daniel, the Daniel of the lion's den, famous Daniel. The interesting thing about Daniel's prayer is that he's confessing the sins of his ancestors over centuries and the sins of the people that he had personally never committed. He identifies the shame that they felt as a nation because of their corporate sin. In fact, that's what God actually wanted for them, wasn't it? Says, I, I want you to be embarrassed. I want the nations to see that I've deserted you because you deserted me. You've chosen to worship all these other gods. Fine. Go have your other gods. And now because of that, you're going to suffer. You're going to be in difficulty. And, and now you're also going to be sent into exile. Ezra, Nehemiah, they follow the example of Daniel by confessing the sins of the nation question I have for you today is do you mourn for your sin now that is different than the shame that we feel and that evil wants us to feel because evil wants us just to be oh you did it again you're never going to change you're always like this you're such a terrible rotten nasty horrible person you're just no good and evil wants us to stay in that place of shame but there's a place that's healthy when we truly mourn for our sin. In fact, we have to come to that if we're ever going to reconcile to another person. We have to face the stuff in us. And, and so have you ever, have you mourned for your sin? James 4 verses 8 to 10, come near to God and he will come near to you. What a wonderful promise. If we come towards God, he's going to come to us. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Uh-oh. Come near to God. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Cry like Nehemiah did. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Whoa. There's a benefit to mourning for our sin. He will lift you up. Matthew 6, 13. Excuse me, I think I just lost. Yep. In, in the Amplified Version, it says in James, as you draw near to God, be deeply penitent and grieve, even weep over your disloyalty. MacArthur says the word to, to grieve there means to be miserable. <laughs> Be, be miserable. <laughs> there are nine words that express sorrow, but that of the nine terms used for sorrow, the one used here, pentheo, mourn, is the strongest. It's the most severe. It represents the deepest, most heartfelt grief and was generally reserved for grieving over the death of a loved one. Have you ever seen somebody who's just lost somebody they love? They, they maybe just heard about the death and what happens to them? They, they can just, they're uncontrollable sometimes. And, oh, no, and it's just, you can't, you can't hold it back. The grief is so intense, so strong, so forceful. He says, that's the word here when he says we need to grieve and mourn for our sin. What happened to David when he stopped hiding his sin? He began mourning over it. 
He said, before that, it was messing up my whole body. But he says, when I finally admitted it and when I confessed it, that's when I got free. And not only do you mourn over your sin, but do you mourn over our sin? Do you mourn for the sins of our community, our church, our nation? Or do you just ignore them? Nehemiah confesses the sins of a nation. He weeps over the condition of his nation. He mourns for their sin. He, Daniel mourns for the sin of his nation. Ezra mourns for the sin. Jesus mourned for the sins of the world. And so he dies on a cross. Do you mourn? Do you let yourself be broken for your sins and our sins? Well, here's the thing. Confession is a spiritual weapon. Use it. Use it. Go to God and be honest. Confession breaks the stronghold of sin. Confession breaks the stronghold of Satan. Confession sets us free. So what do I want us to do today? <laughs> Confess! But here's the thing. I'm not asking you to stand up here and everybody, you know, okay, everybody jump up and tell us your garbage, okay? Well, I was on the internet last night and I uh, was watching, you know, you know, porn for three hours and all. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, we don't need to hear all about that. We don't need you to praise your sin, okay? But we do need to confess. I need you to start. You need to start right now by bowing your head. By closing your eyes. Don't, don't look at anyone else because this is not about them. This is about you. What do you need to confess to God? Ask him. He'll tell you. If you want an honest answer, God will show you what you need to confess. What, what in you do you need to be honest about with him? What in you that if you will let go of, if you'll be honest with him about it, you'll be able to praise him in ways maybe you haven't praised him before. You know, maybe a simple little thing. Maybe just be the way you drive your car. Maybe um, what you think about other people. But it may be something much more controlling. Maybe a sexual addiction that you can't let go of. It may be blatant disobedience to what God's asked you to do. Maybe some other form of sin that you, you just, you know it's sin. Right now, confess it to God. may have never had an abortion. You maybe never had sex outside of marriage. But our nation is so committed to worshiping sex that we also worship the right to take a human life. And as a nation, do we weep over the millions of lives that have died, that have been murdered for something we call choice? As a nation, we are wealthy, we are proud, we are self-serving, 
even when we are helping someone else. We give because we want to see our gift. And one of the greatest sins is the sin of pride. As a nation, we need to confess that. We, in a world which we say there are no gods, worship so many gods. So many things people become so much more important to us money sports whatever we don't worship god perhaps more often than not we worship ourselves will we confess that oh god we confess our sins to you and we want to be free of them. We want to be honest, God. Honest with you. Honest with ourselves. Even honest with our world. We confess that we sin blatantly, defiantly, deliberately against you. And we are sorry.